Okay, today we're going to talk about uh, drug transporters and uh, the role they play in, in the pharmacology of, of anti-cancer drugs. Um, this is a broad, broad topic. I found a ton of papers. There's clearly some known um, polymorphisms that, that play a role with, with methotrexate and with anthracyclines, and I'll give some more examples. Um, and, and what I really want to emphasize is that as we learn more about this, we can, we're really starting to learn where some of the variability comes out and about in terms of how drugs are moved around. So I'm going to um, share my screen now and we'll, we'll talk about this process and um, these, uh, uh, you know, these, these transporters in terms of, of how they, they really affect um, cancer pharmacology, both from a pharmacokinetic and, and pharmacodynamic uh, uh, standpoint. So, when, when we talk about the role of, of, pharma, of these transporters in, in pharmacology, I think it's important to note that, you know, everything happens in solution. Um, the biochemistry, the underlying physiology uh, associated with, with drug action and drug movement happens in solution. And, um, and so when something goes into solution, you know, it has to be water soluble. So everything that's, that's going on has to have some um, affinity for water. And, and that's a problem. Um, for for movement of some of these molecules in and about living organisms because of the fact that everything's separated by biological membranes and as I show here on the right you know oil oil and water do not do not mix it's it's something we we know so these transporters play a fundamental physiologic role in moving um, molecules uh, across membranes and into areas where they can they can um, uh, do the type of biochemistry or physiology that, that they need in, in the natural setting. And, and drugs, um, you know, are, are also going to be in solution if they're going to be active. And so their movement, um, both in and out of the body, is really facilitated by a lot of these transporters. And when we, when we talk about these things, we're really talking about, about transmembrane movement um, and, and these, pro, these proteins that play a role within the membrane to move things in and out. Um, and, and the transporters that we're going to focus on today are the, the ATP binding cassette transporters or the ABC transporters and the solute carrier transporters, the SLC transporters. Now I could, you could probably teach a course, um, on, on these things. Um, and so there's, there's a ton of data and a ton of stuff that's been done over the years since, you know, Victor Ling discovered MDR, um, which is ABCB1, P glycoprotein, and I think 1988, um, and so, you know, in, in the, in the 35 years, 30 ish years that, that these things have been known about, there's been, you know, a whole lot of, of discussion about their impact on drug action and, you know, do we inhibit them? What do we do? And so I'm going to try to encapsulate some of that stuff as we, we talk about, about what these do. And, you know, in terms of the ABC transporters, we're talking about ATP binding cassette. That's what the ABC stands for. Why these are energy dependent and they kind of flip, they go like this, that drug comes in and they flip like this to move drugs out. They don't, you know, it's not like they have a pump, a swirling pump, like you would think about. Um, they just facilitate movement across the membrane by opening this channel, by flipping like this. Um, the solute carriers are a little bit different. They're coupled. You may have two things. They may be ex an exchanger where one thing goes one way, one goes the other, or they may be just a passive transporter. So just they create a, a, a pore that certain molecules can work their way through. And so those are really what we're talking about is in the SLC series is kind of a larger group with coupled transportation with exchangers and with, with passive, passive transport. And so that's, that's really what we're going to talk about today. Um, now I put this slide in because I think it's important to note with, and, and this is ABCB1 and, and kind of a, a cartoon or an X-ray X -ray crystallograph of what it does. And what's interesting to note about some of these transporters is that they actually catch the drug almost when it's still in the membrane. So you have this concentrated component of, the, of this drug coming across. And so this is going to be more um, likely to transport drugs that can get into the membrane. So they're partially fatty. And for the chemotherapeutic drugs, you know, we're talking most of these drugs are not very soluble. You know, doxorubicin's not, vincristine, taxol, um, you know, drugs we got to put in, you know, polyoxyethylated castor oil and ethanol to get into people. Um, 
and even you know a lot of the the tyrosine kinase agents we know i mean gefitinib is very insoluble um, a lot of these are anyway they they actually as they traverse the membrane if they interact with this protein they actually are um, bind to it and and go into the, the the gap here and then are just kind of flipped out and so and the reason i bring this up is it talks about how really highly functional these things can be in terms of moving these drugs out because it catches them as soon as they're coming in. So they don't even get a chance to get in and interact with the target or interact with other proteins that might alter that, that homeostasis or that, that movement. And so it catches them on the way in and kicks them back out uh, in terms of ABCB1. Um, and there's flexibility. I mean, this thing was, was recognized as multi-drug resistant um, protein. Why? Because it can, it, doesn't just transport one drug, it transports multiple drugs. And so when you get up regulation of these transporters, um, you get, you know, this type of, of multi uh, drug resistance, which is a problem because um, you don't have other, you know, salvage therapies to go to for, for efficacy. But I, but I think it's important to note this kind of flipping action and how these, how these transporters work and that they catch things as they're coming in through the membrane. Yeah, I'm just sorry to interrupt. Sure. We're seeing your presenter mode. Is that okay? Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, so, um, the, the, the drug transporters and, and in terms of pharmacokinetics. So I think that there's, there's two things I want to differentiate. We think about these transporters in terms of drug resistance and tumor cells, but they also play a pivotal role in pharmacokinetics and that's important. And the reason it's important is because this was recognized early on by people with expertise, but a lot of drug development, you know, people were still talking about let's use verapamil or yes, let's use some of these other inhibitors to try to sensitize tumor cells. Now, this is not a great strategy with cytotoxic agents who are being dosed at the MTD because you're already right at the edge of as much drug as you can give a patient without, you know, without getting into dose limiting toxicities. And so when you give an inhibitor, all of a sudden you block transport and movement and excretion of these drugs. And it was recognized early on with Taxol and with doxorubicin that when you use some of these inhibitors that were being developed, that you had to dose reduce. Why? Because you're keeping the drug around longer. And so there's a playoff between trying to block the transport out of the tumor um, and as, as well as keeping the pharmacokinetics that were established by the drug um, when it was given by itself in terms of its safety and efficacy. And so illustrated here is you know, a lot of drugs aren't orally bioavailable because of ABC transporters actually pump them back out so they don't actually get absorbed in the gut. They get they get pumped back into the gut lumen. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that grapefruit juice um, is, is contraindicated with some oral drugs is the fact that it plays a role. It has some compounds that inhibit this. And so you actually get more drug in. Um, so it's not, it doesn't affect, and they, it also has some effects on metabolism, but well, some of these effects are on these transporters that it blocks their ability um, to, to keep drugs out. Um, and so these are barriers for protection and movement across the intestinal absor um, membrane. In terms of the liver, a lot of these uh, transporters will pump drugs into the bile or pump them out of the liver cell and back into the blood. In terms of the kidney, we talk about elimination via active secretion. A lot of these things are active secretory proteins found in the distal tubule. Um, and uh, they also uh, play a, a solid role in uh, establishing a, a, a solid blood-brain barrier. And so you got to think about where these, these transporters are going to be um, uh, exist in the body, and it's to protect tissues. And so they're certainly found um, in the... Uh, um, reproductive organs, um, in the testes, um, in uh, the brain. So uh, tissues you want to protect from, from various agents to make, to make really tight junctions and to keep everything from kind of going in there. Um, you have these transporters for protection. So they play a role in, in distribution, metabolism, elimination, which we're going to kind of um, discuss. So in terms of absorption, um, they play a role in the, in the uh, interocyte, in the, in the, um, gut wall, the gastrointestinal epithelium, um, but they also play a role in, in transportation into the bile. So you can see their role in drug absorption will be both in terms of keeping um, drug from being absorbed in the first place from the, from the GI as shown here, where you got stuff moving down here, you got these pumps pumping stuff out. If it gets absorbed, even if it gets into the blood, if it gets to the liver, it can be kicked out into the bile. And so you can have these, um, yeah, these effects on, on drug absorption. Now, 
this is illustrated here. Um, here's a paper that just came out last year on the role of ABCB1. So this this is p glycoprotein or MDR1 is is now called uh, ABCB1. And here's a series of, of studies on some polymorphisms and the polymorphisms are shown here. And what they showed is that the plasma imatinib levels um, were actually elevated in um, some of these patients that had these um, C to T or these TT alleles. So in these polymorphisms, they weren't as good um, at, um, uh, uh, they have decreased activity and they also have decreased expression due to messenger RNA stability. So there's less of it in the gut. And so this is a, a germline um, polymorphism. This is not in the tumor, it's in the patient. Um, it would also exist in the tumor, which may also play a role. Um, but what happens is you just get more drug and you can see that these patients do uh, appreciably better. Um, and um, when you, you know, so, um, and uh, they actually did some, some plasma matinib levels and in these polymorphic patients, they had much higher levels that were greater than seven. I don't know where they came up with this number, 1757 versus below. And you can see the patients that had more drug did better. So again, this may argue that in, in certain patients, you may dose escalate imatinib because clearly you can get to these levels and not have too many problems and you have better patient outcomes. So there may be some dosing in these patients that you may want to adjust. Now, in terms of distribution, like I said, you can alter um, distribution. And this is actually a very interesting paper that, that came out of, of Cell Reports Medicine um, that showed that actually um, even in an altered um, blood-brain barrier, and in this case, um, they, they did it with some VEGF to make it more leaky, as well as in these, in these um, tumors that were put in the brain um, where you had disruption of the, the blood-brain barrier, that the phenotype, not of the tumor, but of the mouse made a difference as well. And this was um, that if you had these knockout mice, and so these, this is not a drug, these are these genetically knockout mice, the tumors um, responded much better to docetaxel because you actually could keep the drug in this kind of um, uh, interstitial space or space around the tumor cells better. And you didn't, you know, kick it back out into the blood. And so you had, you had greater uptake around the, the, the tumor um, through the blood brain barrier so that the, the drug could, could um, uh, get into the tumor cells and you get more efficacy. This is also very tumor dependent, depending on kind of the tightness of the tumors. So it wasn't all of them. And they did some PK studies here to show that in these cases, um, in the ABC, B1 knockouts and the ones you had responding, you had more docetaxel. So again, distribution of the drug within the tumor cells, within the region of the, the organism where the tumor was in this case, in, in the, in the, the CNS um, could be influenced by the, the presence or lack of these, of these transporters. Now, when we, we think about drug elimination and we, we showed the effect on, of the um, ABCB1 mutations on, on, um, uh, imatinib levels, you know, these do play a critical role in, in drug elimination. And um, you can see, you know, just when you think about it, and, and I said they have an effect on pharmacokinetics, you know, they do kick things into um, uh, the liver and then out into the bile. They kick things, you know, across the renal epithelium into the urine. They, they affect absorption. And so this movement of drugs around the body that these things help facilitate can have significant impacts on, on drug elimination, um, drug distribution, and as well as absorption, all as these things are, that are interacting. So, you know, I think more than anything, as you start thinking about these transporters in terms of pharmacokinetics, it's just how things move across membranes or how things are excluded or included, or you get more on one side versus the other side, just by the activity of these, these transporter proteins. So what do these things look like? And I think this is a very interesting paper that just came out last year um, where they looked at the abundance of these things in uh, humans and they looked at adults and, and children. And so this is um, uh, important because you can see for some of these. So first off, just looking at the number of ABC transporters, you know, in the adult liver, there's, you know, 27 or, or whatever, there's, there's 20, 21 or 22, um, that depending on the, on the source. In the pediatric liver, um, there's, you know, a fair number uh, as well. 
Um, they have these biliary, uh, biliary atresia livers that they get, um, and they got those because there's um, uh, some some surgery involved in these patients, so they had access to these livers. And so um, the, you can see in these pediatric um, patients, you also uh, have you know some difference in transporters, and we can go over this a little more in a minute. They looked at kidney and intestine, brain, and skin, as well as also just looking at the protein. And now this is mass spec of the protein, so this is not mRNA. Um, and you can see they have the breakdown of all the, and, and I, I, the only main reason I put this in here is to just get an idea of the ontogeny. I mean, there's a lot of these transporters, ABC, A1, ABC, A2, ABC, A3, A5, A6, A8, B1, B10, B11, you know, B2, B3, B4, B5. And so these are all the MRPs and MDRs that we, we, um, identified in the, you know, late eighties and, and throughout the nineties, now they have this name ABC. So that's, you know, the, the, the same class of proteins. Now, ABC G2 down here is what we used to call breast cancer resistance protein. So that's BCRP, um, another one, but the point is these things are expressed all over the place in these, um, organs of elimination or absorption or protected things like, like the brain. And as shown here in a, you can see that some of these like ABC C3, starts very low it's very non-abundant fetally and then it comes up in the neonatal so you have some differences um and you can see some you know tenfold difference here in abc d3 um uh even you know abc c6 where's b1 b1 also comes up you know you've seen some some changes in these transporters um during development stage so it's one of the things that can account for the differences in drug distribution and elimination in in um uh, uh pediatric versus adult patients. And what they don't have here is what, you know, what you're looking at in aged versus non-aged. Um, so I'm sure there's also some, probably some differences in, in geriatric patients. Um, this is an interesting study looking at, at um, in, in this same study, they looked at pediatric livers in general, as well as these biliary atresia, and they could show that there's some differences. Look at ABCG2 in these patients, they have much, you know, like a thousand fold greater in expression of ABCG2. So some of the changes, the physiology associated with this state where you, you know, you have problems and biliary transport leads to induction and changes in the expression of a lot of these transporters. And the reason I think that's important is it tells you that physiologic differences or any type of physiological obstruction or, or other change, um, these are inducible. You can alter their expression um, over time. Um, so I think, um, you know, this, this is an important paper looking at these proteins it really gives you a flavor for what's where um, and, and the fact that there's a lot of these and there, there's different concentrations, different amounts of them expressed all over the place in these tissues. Um, this has also been done in, in dog tissues. This is actually a study that came out of my laboratory when, when Luke Wittenberg was um, a uh, junior faculty member resident. Um, and, and we did try to do a similar thing in, in dogs. We did this um, a little bit um, before. It was a little bit harder because trying to get some of the sequences and the peptides to do the mass spec analysis. And this was our first kind of endeavor to do proteomics, which um, I hope not to do again because that's... <laughs> It was, it was harder than thought. But I, the point is that there's a lot of these. Um, you can see we use some of the old, some of the new um, naming of these proteins uh, here. Um, and their, their ABC um, transporter names are down here. You can see we saw the same thing in the dogs where you had different amounts of, of proteins. Um, MDR1 here was one of the most significant, as was ABC, um, or I'm sorry, breast cancer resistant protein, BCRP. Um, so ABCG2 and ABCB1 highly expressed in, in the dog. And we looked in the renal cortex and the brain microvessels. Now, we also looked at messenger RNA to see if it correlated to protein. It, it didn't and told us that maybe measuring these things in proteins was important. Um, but again, trying to give us a flavor of, of what's going on with the expression of these things. And, and this is from, I think, uh, 10 dogs that we're able to get necropsy samples from to do this. So... Why is this important? And I'm going to tell a couple stories here in terms of, of what we know about the pharmacology of, of these drugs. Um, you know, uh, about, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, they, they got the knockouts. Might have actually, it's probably longer than that, probably 20 years ago. Um, they have knockout mice that, that they made. They're perfectly normal with MDR1 um, knockout. And one of the first things they did was they started looking at pharmacokinetics of drugs. And here's a whole bunch of drugs. Some of them are chemo drugs like DOCs and then blasting, 
um, other drugs that might be used um, in, in cancer patients um, broadly. But the point here is you can see that there's big differences and a lot of the differences with these ABC1, B1 knockouts accumulation in the brain. Um, and this, this with ivermectin um, is uh, a bit of a, a, bit of a, a, a problem. And um, the, the story I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you quickly um, is comes from dogs and it turns out that they learned a long time ago, um, probably 40, 50 years ago when ivermectin first came in the market that uh, if you gave it to some collies, they would just fall over dead. And there was an old adage that said, white feet don't treat with ivermectin. Um, Katrina Mealy at Washington State figured out that this was due to the fact that there's a mutation in ABCB1 that's prevalent in herding breeds and in collies, especially like 30% of them are homozygous recessive for this and they don't express PGP. Here's a normal beagle liver and here's a, a, a knockout collie or a, one of these collies that they knew was sensitive to ivermectin and you can see they don't have any peacock protein. So they have this, this mutation. There's also a lot of data from the onc side, which is why we cared that um, you could get increased toxicity, um, hematologic toxicity with, with um, vincristine and also severe GI toxicity when, when doxorubicin was used in this, these dogs. So, um, and the reason I bring this up is that we didn't really know what to do with this data, except we'd done a bunch of modeling of doxorubicin um, years before, I mean, you know, five, six years earlier. And the way we moved the drug into the feces and around was, was with ABCB1. So we had an ABCB1 component to it. And so what we decided to do is to, to use kind of a knockout and, and we actually knocked this out and that was easy. We just set it to zero and, and did some simulations. And somebody asked, why didn't you just do the experiment since we had the dogs? And, and the reason was we wanted to look at tissue distribution. So we would have to get a bunch of collies and treat them with docs and kill them. And that's not, you know, and measure drug levels all over the place. That's not what we wanted to do. So anyway, we did this virtually. And the story here um, is basically we, we did a bunch of, we made a bunch of normal dogs that had ABCB1 and then we converted them all to, to collies by knocking out uh, ABCB1. And the interesting thing about this is that when we did these simulations, the area under the curve or the plasma levels of doxorubicin didn't change very much. Um, and so um, that's, that's actually um, shown here when you, when you look at, I guess it's not shown here, it's shown here. Um, when we look at the plasma levels, they don't change that much. They're not really significantly different based in the variability. But what did um, what we did predict would change is uh, distribution and, and drug levels in the gut. So in the gut, they're going to go up threefold. Now, think about this. We're talking about doxorubicin, right, which is dosed at an MTD. If you give three times the dose, if you get three times the exposure in a tissue, you would expect to see a lot more toxicity. Luckily, where it wasn't elevated very much more because the heart has a tendency to look a lot like the plasma in terms of levels was in the heart. So you didn't see this massive, you know, cardiotoxicity, which you would have seen dogs are pretty sensitive to it. And, and you know, you, you just don't get that increased ex ex exposure in the heart. It turned out being in the gut and the liver. And this made sense based on the fact that what, what you know, what veterinary oncologists who are treating these dogs had seen is increased GI toxicity in these knockouts. So we kind of verified that in our simulations. Um, and again, this is all just done on the computer. Um, and the, the cool thing was a lot of what we saw in the dog was very similar to what was seen in these knockout mice. So we had some, some data to say, hey, you know, um, this is what you would expect. And so the, the key here is that at least in, in this case with this polymorphism, we just kind of did some, some dose equivalency. And since the, the, the gut, you know, the, the GI accumulated threefold more docs in these knockouts than um, normal dogs. We, we did kind of a, a, a dose extrapolation. And we said, well, you'd have to do, you know, you'd only have to give 36% of the normal dose. So 10 mgs per kg. And, you know, the, the point of all this was what we decided to recommend. And we published this in, in uh, JVIM, Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine, was that one would probably suggest if you have to dose reduce that much, not to use doxorubicin in this population and use another drug, um, you know, mitoxantrone or something like that, maybe one, uh, another anthracycline or, or something else. But the, the, the point was, is that we we're able to, to simulate this and get an idea of how this, this ABCB1 polymorphism affected the pharmacology and the pharmacokinetics enough to make a difference. So I'm going to tell a little short story uh, again on, on the impact these things can have on pharmacology and how they can make uh, drugs different. 
Um, it actually turns out that cats um, have a, a, a change in the ABCG2 that, that goes throughout all felines. I don't know how deep this has been looked at, if it's been looked at in civets and lions and tigers and stuff like that, but it certainly exists in all domestic cats. So they have this ABCG2 um, uh, deficiency or mutation, and it turns out that one of the drugs that it um, really alters uh, transport in is fluoroquinolones. And the reason this is important is because um, it turns out that that cats have um, when they when they get batrol, um, some fluoroquinolones, they actually can get um, retinal degeneration from it. And it turns out the reason is that uh, that this is is that ABCG2 keeps um, batrol or these fluoroquinolones out of the, the retinal lumen. Um, and so in these cats that have this, you know, in all cats that have a deficiency in this, you get accumulation of fluoroquinolones um, within the, the retinal lumen um, in, the, in the, the vitreous humor. And that's a problem because um, the, the cat eye has evolved to collect light, right? I mean, everybody knows their little eye, their little eyes glow at night. They're really good at collecting light. And um, these fluoroquinolones react with light to generate reactive oxygen. And so the, the retinal degeneration you see in the cat is due to the accumulation of this drug in the eye, an eye that's designed to collect light and the fact that the light reacts with this drug. And so um, this photoreactivity and the fact that you have this mutation um, in, in felines um, leads to this, this strange reaction to fluoroquinolones that we only see in cats. So, and the reason that... That, that I left this story in this lecture is just to, to kind of emphasize that there's a sequela associated with the drug, with the tissue, and with the activity of that drug, which means that you'll see these types of effects in a drug-specific manner, both with ivermectin and the collie, where you get this accumulation in the brain, um, and you know this, this GABA um, uh, based drug is then going to cause you know this, the, the type of issues that you'll see in the CNS. And then in the cat, this ABCG2 mutation that means the drug accumulates in the eye and, and you get this weird effect because with this drug, now other drugs can get in the eye, but if they're not photoreactive, who cares? Um, and this is the problem again with, with uh, the fluoroquinolones in this case. So the point is it's a drug specific and tissue specific and transporter specific event sequela that can lead to these effects. Okay. So lots of pharmacokinetic things that can happen. If you go look, I have a couple other papers, you know, there are so many polymorphisms in ABCB1 um, and, and other transporters. There's a lot of, there's some diseases associated with this, some known syndromes in people. I didn't want to go into those, but I, you know, I think if you, you look at your transporter, you're interested in, you'll see a ton of this stuff. Okay. Now, what I want to talk a little bit about in the, in the, for the, for the last part of this lecture is, is response. Um, and the fact that the way these things were identified wasn't because they caused pharmacokinetic differences. Victor Ling pulled out MDR multi-drug resistance protein because it caused uh, tumor cells to be resistant to chemotherapy. And so we, we need to also think about the impact expression of these things in tumor cells has on response. And um, in the age of omics, um, I'm going to kind of focus on some omics based studies, um, because I think um, they're the ones that are that are kind of capturing a lot of the big data to give us some idea here. And um, this one is a, is a study that just looked at prediction of drug sensitivity and resistance, uh, looking at, at the, the profiling of these ABC transporter genes in cancer cells. Um, and this is a little bit of a, of a piercing glimpse into the obvious. It was done, it came out in cancer cell in 2004 um, from Mike Gottesman's group. And, and what they showed is that, you know, ABC B1, they got these really strong correlations in the NCI60 uh, negative correlation. So the more ABCB1 you had, the less sensitive you were to doxorubicin, vinblastine, taxane analogs, and bizantrine. Um, and so uh, again, this really starts to tell us that that you know these are playing a significant role, and we can see it in the informatics side that the more of these transporters you have, the less drug response you're gonna you're gonna have. Now we've known that for for quite a while, but I think it's nice that the the informatics uh, comes out of it as well. There's also some negative correlations that came out. So the more you expressed, the more sensitivity you had. 
it turns out that that's just because of some of these things pump drugs in. Um, and uh, they actually went back and looked at some of these predictions. This is an interesting paper to show that what they were seeing was actually real. So there are people starting to look at, at profiling and trying to identify up front in, in panels of cell lines that we know have various expression and or potentially mutations, um, what role these play in drug response. And so that's pretty powerful. And um, here's an, another paper that looked at the systematic prediction of drug resistance caused by transporter genes. And this just came out in scientific reports um, last year um, with erlotinib. So now we're looking at a, you know, a, a, a EGFR inhibitor. So here with Tarceva, you can see that um, in the non-responders, they had a lot more expression of ABC, um, uh, C3 in the cancer cells. This solute transporter um, was, was not significant. Um, this one was SLC04A1. Um, and so you can see that you start to see kind of this, this Serpina1 transporter was also upregulated. And there's some, you know, um, Cox proportional hazards associated with this and some more or less better responses in these patients with regards to expression of these various transporters in their tumor cells. So one could imagine um, that as we start to learn a little bit more about this, you may be profiling um, uh, tumors, not only, um, you know, for uh, specific transporters, but maybe overall, you know, what role this one plays with this one and that one. In, in terms of patient response and, you know, not just the, the, the covariates and pulling them out, but with all the transporters in general. Um, so I think this, this is important as we start learning what they do with various drugs. And as we get new drugs on board, all of a sudden it becomes, um, uh, you know, how do they act? Now, I think it's important to note that, you know, some of these, the, you got to remember that a lot of these tyrosine kinase agents work in the ATP binding pocket of the kinase. Now, why is that important? Well, it turns out that they, they interact in the ATP binding pocket of some of the ATP binding set transporters. And so they can act as both competitive and non-competitive inhibitors of these transporters. And this has been taken advantage of with gefitinib. You can actually get better ear and otique and oral absorption um, in patients with gefitinib because you block transport of irinotecan by ABCG2 um, out of, you know, back into the gut lumen. So you get better absorption. And so there's been some studies with these and, inter, you know, so you, you can get some interactions, some positive interactions potentially with some of the um, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, based on their interaction with these transporters and with other agents. So it gets really interesting when you start looking at the polypharmacology and how some of these things may interact. Now, when we start talking about the solute transporters uh, in drug response, here's a paper that just came out last year. It's a CRISPR screen. Um, so they looked at, at knocking out some of these, um, a bunch of these solute transporters and a CRISPR screen, and then looking at drug response and the knockouts versus the non-knockouts. Um, and this is very interesting because this one solute transporter, solute 19A, 1A, um, they, the, in the wild type, the wild type are much more sensitive to methotrexate than the, than the polymorphic or the mutant ones. And it's because these actually transport methotrexate in the tumor cell. So you need active solute transporter. The solute transporter, when it goes down, they become resistant. Some of these transporters also, when they looked at some drugs and some responses they saw, played a role in cofactors or metals. Um, the platinum agents are known to play a role with these, these solute transporters in terms of getting in and out. Um, so metal transport and how those metals play a role in the mechanism of action of drugs. With doxorubicin, we know there's some solute transporter issues with it. Is that because of, of free iron or dox itself or doxorubicin? All There's been a lot of things looking at that in terms of cardiotoxicity. But the point is that this gets complicated as you start again having these pores and these transporters that are moving drugs in and about. Um, and in this paper, it showed some examples where um, you needed the intact wild type transporter to have the most activity. Okay. Okay. I've talked about a ton of stuff, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with a very interesting review trends in cell biology paper that I came across while, while doing this. And 
um, they're really starting looking at um, these authors' uh, immune response and the fact that we've learned a lot about, you know, lactate, methionine, um, uh, choline, arginine, alanine, and how a lot of these nutrients play a role in T cell activation, dendritic cell activity, macrophage, you know, type one versus type two and immune response. And it turns out that a lot of um, these things are moved in and out of these cells by solute uh, uh, carriers. And so um, they really started looking at, you know, is it possible to start looking at targets to some of these solute carriers to inhibit, to en enhance um, immune response or, you know, decrease immune suppression based on a lot of these interactions. And so I think this is something you'll probably see uh, in the drug development arena as we start looking at how we can modulate, you know, cell phenotype, and in this case, immune cell phenotype based on the more or less uptake of various um, solutes and nutrients and or other compounds that they need or don't need. Now, this is going to get tricky. I don't know how specific any inhibitors or any, but you can certainly postulate that there's going to be drug interactions or things that you may see where people start may start doing that. Okay. I know I just went through a ton of stuff. My main goal with this lecture is to try to emphasize that these uh, transporters play a role in the normal pharmacokinetics of things that they play a role in drug resistance. And as soon as you start, you know, it was a nice idea, you know, in the early nineties when we started talking about, you know, we can block multi-drug resistance with inhibitors. They pretty quickly found out that as soon as you started giving these inhibitors to patients, you had to dose reduce because of the, the fact that these drugs stayed around for a long time. Now you'd altered the pharmacokinetics. So altered pharmacokinetics, altered pharmacodynamics. How does that affect dose response in the big, this back to the first lecture I gave where PK is dose, right? And, and PD is response and those things need to go together. You alter the dose of these drugs and the exposure by altering the pharmacokinetic component by interacting with these transporters, even though you're also altering the pharmacodynamic response by making the tumor cell uptake the drug and maybe have more of a response. There's a trade-off there and you need to understand that and, and make sure that you're collecting some advantage with these types of combinations. Okay, um, I'll take any questions. I was just going to mention the next Cancer Pharmacology Colloquium is going to be February uh, 10th. I'm actually going to talk about anthracyclines, and I came up with a, with a title, The Most Useful and Probably Most Hated Drugs in Treating Cancer Patients. Um, and, and the reason is, is, is I think that, you know, the, the history of these agents is, is pretty, uh, pretty deep and pretty, pretty crucial. And, you know, a lot of people think they know a lot about these drugs, but they've been around a really long time and there's a lot of interesting things about them. So I'm going to kind of start talking about some, um, specific drugs and specific populations and specific things, um, as, as we go through, um, this, these discussions. So with that, I will gladly answer any questions that people might have and uh, go from there. I see there's one thing in the chat. Oh, okay. That was Adela telling me who was in presenter mode. Anybody have any questions or comments? Thank you, Dan. That was great. Yeah. I mean, I think this is really interesting, especially from the, I hadn't, I didn't realize there, um, until I got into looking at a lot of this stuff, the pediatric differences, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wait, <laughs> that could be, a, could be a big difference and play a role kind of in some of these um, differences we see. Okay. Well, this is going to be recorded for anybody that uh, Adela recorded it, so it should be up. And with that, I will see all of you hopefully next month and we'll talk about anthracyclines. It'll be way more exciting than you think it will be. I'll make sure of that. So, okay. Thanks, Thank Stella. You. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone.